We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Oliver Gage. Oliver is the Head of Analysis and Recruitment at Houston Dynamo of the MLS. He's worked with Sheffield Wednesday in England and also with the University of Virginia Men's Soccer in their Analysis Department, which helped win the 2014 National Championship. Oliver is also the founder of Coach Tech, which is a consultancy that helps coaches and clubs build video and data analysis processes to help players. So they offer online courses, topics including evidence-based coaching, match analysis, opposition scouting and analysis as well. I've known about Ollie's work for quite a while with the stuff he shares online. I connected with him a couple of months ago and ran a few ideas by him about what I wanted to do on player development and trying to back things up with video and, and a statistical approach to it. And Ollie challenged me in a few areas uh, of what I was doing. And then I took his online course, really, really enjoyed it. Video is an area that I use, but I wanted to improve, especially the organization of it and how to back it up and, and maybe strengthen what I was doing. So Ollie's really helped me there. So we're excited to team up this month and offer a three part webinar on elite player development. September 25th, October 8th and October 23rd. So the three parts are, number one, we'll be adopting an evidence-based approach to individual player development. So looking at player profiling, why we should adopt an evidence-based approach, looking at examples from Ollie's work, looking at examples from some of my work, the different ways and the different coaching philosophies that you can put in to evidence-based, looking at exercises that go alongside this, looking at how we can collect evidence that can show progression, and then the reinforcement of good habits always aligned with video, and then building evaluation sheets to use with our players. Uh, webinar number two will be developing, implementing, and then reinforcing a playing philosophy. So how does all this work align with the tactical model from the coach? What's the playing philosophy? Why do we need one? How does it help coaching process? How can we build individuals into this? And discussing the role of analysis to evaluate performance during this day, and then how we can we build the feedback processes in place? How do we conduct video sessions? How do we uh, sell what we're trying to get players to do as well? And then part three will be a little bit of both put together, putting everything together, a little bit of Q and A. What coaches want to talk about, revisit from the first two, and then again looking at examples from Ollie's work and my work. Uh, and then trying to build those processes in place for your side as well and giving coaches a platform to ask those questions and to interact with Ollie and myself. And registration is now open, so the link will be online. So you can go ahead and register for that there. Uh, that's limited to 100 people. So I would go ahead and get in there early. Uh, really, really excited about doing it, interacting with a lot of coaches and then working with, with Ollie as well and putting it together. So I think it'll be great. And I would advise coaches who have any interest in player development, any interest in building those processes with their players as well, um, strengthening and improving uh, to, to get on board with it. So looking forward to that there. This is the first performance analysis podcast we've done so excited to hear what you think of this here ollie has a really 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 good perspective on the game top top experience and is going to challenge you i think in one or two areas during this interview so excited what you think of it let me know as always on twitter at gary kernine on instagram at gary kernine if you want to shoot me an email gary at modern soccer always interested to hear what, what coaches like about it, what, what resonated with them. Um, before you shoot off, please as well, give it a, a rating on the iTunes page. Always appreciate the feedback, always appreciate the shout outs and always appreciate you listening. Here's Ollie and enjoy. Ollie, thanks very much for joining me this morning for the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Thanks very much. It's great to, great to be on. Talk about your path and, and where you're at now and, and what steps you've, you've taken to get to this level. 
Yeah, I think my path's been a pretty weird one, to be honest, and definitely maybe not the traditional route that a lot of people might take uh, to make a way in the in this world. So I, I came across to the US just like a lot of players do on a scholarship. I was a master's student, came and played for a, a Division two school in Pennsylvania and, you know, graduated with not really any clear idea of what I wanted to do, except that I didn't want to sit in an office all day. Um, so when I went back home to Sheffield in the UK, I reached out to a contact in Sheffield Wednesday and managed to gain an internship there in the analysis department, pretty much just based on the premise that, you know, I knew, I knew football a little bit, I knew soccer and I wasn't going to be out of place in a club having been an academy player previously. Um, so I did that for about nine months and then came back out to the US I took a six month uh, coaching contract with one of the uh, like the coaching placement companies in Washington, D.C. Um, and kind of very luckily, to be honest, there was a, a job going at the University of Virginia uh, in the men's soccer program as the operations assistant, uh, which was about a 45 minute drive from where I lived in D.C. Um, so I got an interview there and kind of went in and pitched like the performance analysis route and how the operations assistant role could almost double up as an extension of the coaching staff. Um, and George Matulis and uh, Mike Behonik, who was there at the time, were were excellent. And I think they saw uh, they saw the potential for the role and what it could bring to college soccer, um, and hired me. Uh, we had two great years there. You know, some success. We ended up winning the national championship in my final year, which was which was great. And I have to admit, you know, I, I like to think I did make a small difference, but uh, the team was very good already. Um, and then I got the job at Houston and I've been here for, for three years now. So it's definitely been uh, a non-traditional route from, from college soccer to the professional level of the game. And I think I've had some, some luck along the way, but a lot of hard work and a lot of kind of sleepless nights uh, going over game film and databases and spreadsheets and stuff to get where I am. What inspired you to go down the, the sports analysis road? You touched on it there. Was Did you see an opening there or were you inspired by champ manager? What, what did it? Uh, I'll be honest, you know, I spent a lot of time playing championship manager or football manager as a kid. Um, I'm definitely one of the ones that I prefer the kind of strategical side of the game rather than sitting on FIFA and, mm -hmm. and playing as one of the players. Uh, so it's always interested me, and I think as a person, I'm very kind of logical and cerebral like that. Um, and if you kind of go back to my story and backtrack a little bit, I actually did my undergrad at Leeds Met University. And uh, the guys I started hanging around with there, uh, like my bunch of mates, included someone called Chris Trotter, who's now the head of recruitment at Middlesbrough. So when I when I went home, I kind of stayed in touch with him and saw what he was doing at Borough. And when I went home after finishing my master's, we went out for a bit and he told me about his job and what he does with with the head coach and stuff. And, you know, I really like the idea of it. And I thought this is, you know, this is great. He's getting paid to to analyze football all day and to talk football in the office. And I couldn't think of anything better if I'm not going to make it as a player or as a coach you know because I, I didn't have any real badges at the time and no professional playing background which is obviously a, a pretty big barrier to entry uh, at the first team level um, I thought there's probably no better way and no better job to have in the game than that so um, luckily I, I knew someone in Sheffield Wednesday as I mentioned before but yeah definitely uh, it definitely wasn't something that I, I laid out from a long way back you know I kind of saw an opportunity and and took it and got some luck along the way. So many coaches today seem to have their their career paths especially in the US seem to have their career paths mapped out and knowingly or unknowingly their growth in their jobs goes along with the financial rewards with it so as they get bigger jobs they get more money but so many podcast guests have told us that that's not the way you should map out your career. You should be prepared to work for free. You should be prepared to, to put yourself out a little bit more. Um, is that what you did then with Sheffield United? 
Um, yeah, so I, I was, I was on paid at Sheffield, at Sheffield, um, you know, it actually cost me money to get there on the tram every day. Um, and even, you know, I was being paid at Virginia, but the amount of money that a, an operations assistant gets, you know, I could have took a, a standard club coaching job in DC or wherever and made probably two or three times as much as I did. Um, and I understand it's very difficult to kind of turn down the money at certain points in your life. And, you know, I've made a couple of decisions in the past based on money, which I now regret. Um, but yeah, if I could give any advice to anyone looking to get into the industry or, you know, just looking to succeed, um, in general, the short term advantage of taking the money definitely does not outweigh the long term benefit you would get of taking the role that gets you where you need to be. Uh, one of the I've actually had an intern here at Houston with me, a kid called Alex Rathke, who does a lot of stuff on Twitter and some data viz stuff. Uh, and he came out and worked for me for free and he was excellent. And if I had the ability to hire him right now, financially and with the budgets here and stuff, I would in a heartbeat, just as an example of, of where it can get you. The college game over here gets a bit of a bad, bad rap, mostly among US college and club coaches. Um, what did you learn from having grown up around the English game and then played in the US and the college and then coming to Virginia? You know, as an analyst, what did you see in the college game that you appreciated then or maybe appreciate now? Was there anything? Yeah, so, I mean, the level I played back home in England was like uh, Unibond, you know, like just below the conference sort of level. Um, and I came over to, I'll be honest, I came over a little bit arrogantly thinking that I was going to be, you know, one of the best players out here. Um, that was kind of the the feeling you sometimes get in England. You I think know, we all did see, that, Ollie. <laughs> yeah, you know, and um, when you watch like Soccer AM back home and they have got the clips, you know, taking the piss out of the American commentary <laughs> and the way things are done. And, you know, you see viral videos of the, the MLS fans um, and they've got, you know, all these these companies kind of taking the piss out of them a little bit. Um, you, I think it's very disrespectful to the level of the American game, to be honest. So I came across and played and I was, you know, my division two school was very good. You know, we were, we were consistently winning 16 out of 20 games in a season and making the NCAAs, you know, we rarely lost. And I was lucky to play in the MPSL, uh, for a very good team that made the national semifinals too. But there was, you know, a whole level above that at Division One. You know, the boys at Virginia, they were unbelievable technically and, you know, physically very dedicated to the game. And I think, you know, most players in that Virginia team and in the top 50 schools at Division One level could go and pick up 100, 200, 300 pounds a week back home playing semi-pro in England. And I think people don't realise that. And when they disrespect the level i think the technical ability of the american college player at that level um, is far greater than people give credit for and obviously there's a there's a disparity between the professional level here and you know the premier league or the championship sometimes but at the level of college soccer and non-league in england for me there's no comparison college soccer is a, a much better quality going back to that presentation you mentioned to get yourself get your foot in the door at the university of virginia just curious to see because a lot of people always ask you know they've got interviews or how do i get on a coach's radar and how much homework did you do about their current team and how much of it was i do this i do this i do this yeah so i i focused almost solely on what i could do for them uh in terms of i showed them actually some examples of um a very famous one in my world is the inefficiency of crossing. You know, if you use crossing as a, a primary trans creation technique, then you're going to get yourself into some bother. So I kind of started looking at some, some very like basic analytics type stuff and some almost best practice guides and showed them like a playing model of if you do this, 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 you know, kind of reduce crossing as much as possible focus on through balls, you know, stuff like this, um, and show them the evidence behind it. I kind of went that way. I didn't focus too much on the current squad, um, just because, 
Uh, honestly, I thought I could do a better job of focusing on what I could do for them mm. um, with that stuff. And I'll be honest, the the staff at Virginia were unbelievable. I mean, college, like you said earlier, college soccer sometimes get a, gets a bit of a knock and the way George plays sometimes gets a bit of a knock off your top draw soccers and, and websites like that. But I think George Galnovac is a very, very smart and a very good head coach. And he does a very good job of surrounding himself with people that can improve him. You know, he's he's in no way afraid of hiring someone that is a little bit outside the box. You know, if you go all the way back, he actually hired Pierre Barrio, who's now the, the fitness coach at, um, I think he's at LA Galaxy now, but he was with the men's national team for a while. You know, he, he worked with him all the way back when fitness coaches were, weren't really a thing, you know, especially in the college game. He had the, the kind of foresight to hire him. And then with me, you know, I was the first one hired in college soccer. Um, George kind of saw where the game was going and saw where it could go. And he hired me. And then my replacement, AJ Barnold, actually just got hired by US Soccer a few months ago to work for them. So he's almost developed like a, a pipeline to the pros in the analysis world too. That's brilliant to hear a, a college coach because like that, that would be my, not criticism, but one thing I would love to see a little bit more of in the game over here, um, even at club and college, is just not even thinking a little bit outside the box more in terms of tactically, but thinking more inside, outside the box in terms of staffing and what they can bring to you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to kind of group everybody together, you know, and it's, it's unfair to do so. But there definitely is a feeling, uh, and I've actually had some experience with it since I, I kind of started um, my my stuff on the side with Coach Tech. There's definitely a feeling, and I've like I said, I've experienced it that some college coaches aren't interested in pushing the boat out and improving as much as they can, um, and you know it's it's tough because the few that do say, no, I just want an assistant who runs camp to make me as much money as possible. And I'm happy with the three month season because I get to be on the golf course for the other nine months. You know, there are them people out there, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. and it ruins, it ruins the reputation of the good ones, you know, but I think we are seeing a shift now towards coaches that are a lot more methodical and really want to improve themselves and be the best they can be rather than just picking up a, a paycheck. And with that, you know, the, the better staff follow and they'll employ the right people rather than the easiest people for them. As an analyst, a lot of your work is objective and, and evidence-based. How do you then balance being flexible in, you know, just the game in general and, and your approach to delivering that information? Yeah. I mean, with, with any, you know, profession and, you know, you're going to have your, your tendencies you know, fitness coaches, some will prefer certain techniques over others. And it's the same with analysts. You know, I try and be very flexible in what I deliver and how I deliver it. Um, I think I've got the benefit of being somewhat of a former player, you know, like an academy player back home from Nottingham Forest and then a college player out here. So it's much easier to kind of approach a coach with a tactical aspect when you can play in a staff game with them and build that relationship and you know you're not you're not kind of out of place in a staff game and you speak the right language so it's very important i think as an analyst or any member of staff that you you develop them relationships in order to kind of then give you the comfort level with the coach to approach something that might be a little bit sensitive or challenge an opinion And I think in my journey so far, you know, I've been doing this for seven years now. I've obviously, I think I've got better at reading the game and understanding the tactical side and the physical side because, you know, you're in the environment, you pick up things. But I think undoubtedly the biggest skill that I've improved and picked up on is the psychological side of how to speak to coaches, how to interact with them, how to relay my information in a way that's going to get taken on board rather than kind of being abrasive because generally what I do is challenge opinions and challenge common beliefs so it's if you don't do it the right way you can get yourself in some hot water pretty quickly you know and I've learned some tough lessons along the way 
you know, uh, I've got some stories <laughs> for sure where, you know, I thought I was getting fired tomorrow because uh, I, I slipped up in a meeting and said the wrong thing or said something disrespectful to a coach after a loss. And I'm going home to my wife going, oh, yeah, I'm going to get fired tomorrow. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I was, uh, I was in the doghouse for a couple of days for sure. But, uh, you know, and again, one message I would give to any aspiring analyst, coach, no matter whoever it is that's, you know, maybe a bit lower down on the totem pole is you've got to figure out a way to, to learn how to interact with the higher ups and with the coaching staff that kind of command respect. And if you can do that and build them relationships, then I think you'll go far. Yeah. That, that bias is really important to try and get through, right? Because we're all biased in a certain way. You mentioned the crossing study you did before. Like I would be biased in, in being a big, big fan of crossing the ball. Well, how do you get through, or is it a challenge to get through that bias with a coach who's been really, really successful? Yeah, I mean, uh, just naturally, you know, the way human perception works is you you put higher weight on successful events than the negative events. So if you take a, you know, a 30-yard screamer from a central midfielder, you know, you remember that goal all season, but you don't remember the 25 shots that he's missed and gone over the bar or the keeper's caught easily. Um, so when you've got a coach who has been successful in the past with crossing. Like there's a time and a place for crossing, of course. And there's certain teams that are more susceptible to it. You know, if you've got Andy Carroll up front, you're going to be much more successful than you are with Aguero. Um, so once a coach has already got that preconceived notion that crossing is going to be successful, it's very difficult for, you know, the computer nerd to, to go to him and say, hey, we shouldn't be crossing the ball. You know, then the first thing that comes into his mind is, oh, who the, who's this guy telling me not to cross anymore? You know, I've got here by doing this and now I've got some laptop guy telling me that I shouldn't be crossing. And that's where I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the way to relay information and the way to build relationships with coaches in the right way um, is such an undervalued skill, in my opinion. And, you know, it's just like you can always look at it like a player. You know, you've got uh, a player with unbelievable technique and composure and vision, but he's got the wrong attitude or whatever it is, and he can't affect games because of the way he plays or because of things off the field. And it's the same with an analyst or a fitness coach or a psychologist or whoever it is. You're only as good as the change in behavior you can affect on others mm. you know you can have all the knowledge in the world and there's there's people in this world for sure that have got much more knowledge than me but they can't relay it and they can't relate to people and they can't get it across to the coaching staff and so that knowledge is wasted how, how different is analyzing a game in the championship than mls uh yeah i'd say it's considerably different the the tactical differences between the two extremes in MLS are huge. So in the championship, what you find or what you found five years ago when I worked there was all teams are very similar and it was much easier to kind of focus on your strengths and reinforce the messages that you want to reinforce as a staff. And if you look after yourself, you'll be fine. Whereas MLS... Um, there's such huge differences between, you know, your possession-based New York Cities or Columbuses versus your counter-attacking Houston Dynamos from last year or Vancouver Whitecaps. Um, and you don't really see, in my opinion anyway, you don't really see as defined a styles in the championship as you do in MLS, which is very strange, you know, because people, people kind of knock it and say it's not where it needs to be and, and this and that, but in my opinion, the MLS is far ahead of the championship from a tactical perspective. What about the player then? What about the, and again, you talked about generalization, so I don't want to try to prod you for a blanket answer, but are there differences in the mindset or the approaches of US and English players that jump out to you? Yeah, so obviously I've, I've just kind of mentioned that tactically I think MLS is a level above so there, there has to be something, right, that kind of causes it to have the reputation it does. And I think um, there's something ingrained in, the. Uh, it's a cliche, and I hate to say it, the players in Europe 
and you know even Argentina, Brazil, you know the the kind of top footballing nations. That's just you can't quite put your finger on. I don't know if you want to call it a will to win, or a desire, or just knowing what it takes to win a game of football the ugly way that still isn't quite here yet. You know, I I feel like from a developmental point of view, maybe in the youth side of things, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt kids enough when they lose. Um, It doesn't mean enough because they've got fallback options with, you know, going to college and having a great job or whatever it is. But I don't want to call it a softness because I think that's a little bit disrespectful. But there's definitely kind of like a now a savvy, you know, a game intelligence there that players in the championship kind of have in terms of knowing how to see out a game or knowing what needs to be done on a, a game in December, you know, just to get the three points that sometimes isn't quite there yet here with MLS. I spoke to someone about this a few weeks ago, the external pressure of someone booing you off, the rewards or even the yeah the abuse that you'll get if you don't get the result does that change the game in a way in England that it doesn't over here yeah I think it does so um it's actually I'll give you a a perfect example you know um, I'm a big Sheffield United fan and um a a few weeks back we sent a player out on loan to uh, I don't know someone in league one and, you know, I, I, he announced he was going on loan, whatever. So I just clicked on the announcement and was scrolling through the Twitter replies. And the Sheffield United fans were killing him, you know, saying, it's about time, you know, we got rid of you, you're dead wood, you've been here, go score some goals at a level that you deserve to be playing at, like all of this stuff. And even after a game, you know, you get people on Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is, you know, saying, you're this, you're that, we played like crap. And you get that to an extent in America, but you don't it's nowhere near what you get in the in the championship or back home you know it means so much to so many people that it's the be all and end all for a lot of people's life you know they structure their life around going to away games and going and watching Sheffield United in Portugal in pre-season and stuff like this and you just don't get that pressure here yet from the fans and even with the managers you know in the championship, you're only ever eight games away from being fired, you know, and, and here there's 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 a, definitely a pressure on the head coaches and it's getting that way because, you know, the injection of money into the league the last couple of years is a lot more accountability, but there's still a little bit more job security and a little bit more comfort over here right now. Let's talk about the process of analysing a game. So say the game is on the Saturday. But obviously, you don't show up on the Saturday with your computer. The, the preparation side and, and developing the KPIs, are they done at the start of the season or are they changed from every game? Or, or How does that process work? Yeah, it's, obviously every coaching staff is different and you, a, a huge part of my role is adapting what I do to, to suit the head coach. There's no point just supplying one thing and saying this is it, take it or leave it. But generally speaking, um, mm-hmm. if you go full picture, you'll have a meeting uh, hopefully a number of meetings in pre-season and even before pre-season when you're building the team about how you want to play, what that looks like, what that means. And then based off of that, I will go away before the season starts and start building out you know, some KPIs and some objectives and some targets uh, to measure success in the short, medium and long term. Um, and then on a game by game basis, you know, you have a post-game evaluation on how we played. Did we meet our objectives? Did we hit our KPIs? And if yes or no, how have we been doing in them KPIs over the last five, six, seven, ten games, whatever it is? And then, you know, pre-game, I think people would be surprised about how much goes into it and how much work gets done, but it's very rarely we'll go into a game without watching six or seven games of the opponents and doing extensive video, both as a team, and one on one and sometimes that can you know that can span two three weeks for an upcoming game sometimes you'll have done your preparation for this game on saturday but you're already showing players clips for the game next weekend to be aware of to start kind of developing them thoughts in their mind so um i think the game's changed and any modern coaching staff has to be extremely flexible to meet the players needs and demands I think the days where the manager just does whatever the manager wants to do and then the players have to kind of toe the line is gone. 
I think players have the power now in general and it's up to us to be flexible and to get the most out of the players and provide them with what they need. Yeah, on that, they want the information, right? Like players today want that information in different ways. But in, in general, they all want to be better informed of how they're doing and how they can get better. Yeah, you know, I'm very big on players taking ownership of their own analysis and their own development. Uh, and it's something that I kind of encourage a lot and I push towards people. Uh, we live in a world now, and I, I think I mentioned this in a blog piece, actually, for uh, for my Coach Tech website a while back. We live in a world where, first of all, players have grown up surrounded by information. So whether it's, you know, ratings on FIFA or Football Manager or Sky Sports News or whatever it is, players are being fed video and stats from, you know, as soon as they kick a ball, really. So we now live in a world where players want these stats on themselves. But second of all, because of social media, I think we live in a, a world where young people especially are looking for self-validation and, you know, almost not feeding an ego. It's the wrong kind of phrase, but it's definitely about them. So naturally, I think they're going to want to see their performances and their stats and their touches because their world is now about them. You know, their Instagram is about them. Their Twitter is about them. Their Facebook is about them. And they get feedback from the fans and whoever it is about them. So I think it's very natural that when we feed in information, it needs to be about them. Otherwise, they're going to lose their interest. Apart from obviously then you're talking about analysis and about them, how much of it is outside the actual 90 minutes themselves? What else is analyzed in your world? Uh, yeah, there's a lot. You know, we we analyze training. So training is filmed every day. We obviously have all the, the GPS and the physical the physical data. But even within drills, you know, um, it's very easy and very possible for me to, to analyze a shooting drill or shooting drills over the long term. Um, so, for example, you take a forward in the league you might have a sample size of 100 shots over a season, maybe, that they've taken to come up with a comparison versus another forward about who's the better finisher or whatever it happens to be. But if you take training drills, you know, you can take 5, 10, 15 shots in a training drill, which is five games worth of information right there. So if you extrapolate that by three times a week times, you know, 30, 40 weeks over the season, you've turned your sample size of 100 shots over a year into 1,000 shots over a year. So you can have a lot more confidence and a lot more feedback on your findings. So um, it's happening now in the league and we're starting to get more resources. But even back home, you know, Premier League teams have dedicated training analysts who do nothing towards games or post-game or pre-game. All they do is analyze training and that's it. Um, and that's the way it's going to go. You know, you get so much contact time with players these days that I think it's only natural to to do. Obviously, you have to squeeze every piece of information and every competitive gain you can out of every situation. So analyzing training is is a must. You know, you've got 10 hours worth of football there in a week versus two on the field. High school club and, and so many college coaches don't have access to video analysis and have to do it themselves as coaches and recruiters and fundraisers and, and all that good stuff. What, what's the starting point for them? Where would you advise them to start? Um, I think the most important thing to, to do is to get your game on video one way or another. Um, I think if you could take all my equipment off me and tell me I could only ever use one thing, it would probably be my video camera that I keep. Um, you know, they, they're getting much cheaper and you can go to, to Best Buy or wherever and a, a $200 home video camera is going to be good enough to film a game as long as you've got an elevated view. And obviously with that comes a whole new set of problems if you don't, but there's, there's systems out there now for a couple thousand dollars that you can get, like your high pods and, and vantage points and stuff like that, which can give you the ability to film your game in a wide angle from an elevated view. Um, I guess my message to people would be, you know, there's, there's a very kind of famous thing in my world called the misinformation effect, which essentially has proven on multiple occasions across multiple studies that even elite level coaches only remember about 40% of the game accurately. 
So if you if you're kind of just what you'd call a regular coach, you know, a high school coach, a, a club coach, whatever it is, who doesn't have video analysis at your disposal, think of your your finest moment as a coach, whether it was a huge goal or winning a big game or whatever it was, the chances are it's more likely that that is remembered inaccurately in your brain than it is accurately. And if you times that times a thousand events in a season and player development and and all the details you want to go into, it becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly that you're kind of making important decisions about players' future and players' developments based on inaccurate information. So for me, it's absolutely essential that you start recording this stuff and you wouldn't believe how much things change based on your memory and then reviewing it after the fact. So for me, uh, kind of getting a record of that and getting it on camera is essential. And then once you've done that, you've kind of won the battle. Like there's so much software and technology out there that you can use to share video, to cut up video, you don't need to buy a thousand dollars worth of software to do video analysis. You can do it with iMovie. You can do it with like Longo Match, which is a free piece of software. Like there's so much stuff out there. I can almost guarantee that if you go into a project with the right knowledge, all you need is a video camera, and you can perform pretty high level video analysis with your team. It's it's definitely for me. It's definitely been the biggest growth in my coaching development in the past five years has been aligning align the video with using the, the coach logic system with the, the game to communicate and connect with players but also like you said that that view of the game so many times I've gone into a match and watched it again with a different opinion of what I had when I started uh, do you do the same yeah I mean from from the the second the final whistle goes, your your brain is being affected and your memory is being affected by certain things. So whether it's going on the MLS app and looking at how many shots or looking at the highlights or looking at chances created, whether it's a conversation with the staff in the locker room after, you know, and one staff member saying, oh, this guy played or whatever it is, immediately after the game your perception of events is being affected by the outside world you know we live in a world now where as i mentioned before with the players there are so many information sources there's blogs there's people on twitter giving their opinion there's factual websites you know that ha- that host all the stats whatever it happens to be it's almost impossible to finish a game of football now and get 24 hours out and watch the game without having your memory of it influenced by an outside source so you know the importance of sitting down and trying to objectively kind of isolate your thoughts and and kind of go into watching a game with a fresh opinion or or you know a fresh approach to okay forget what i thought on the night forget my emotion let's see what happened in this game it's so important um and yeah my my memory and my perception of certain events has been completely flipped 180 on a number of occasions just by watching the video. What age should you begin video analysis? That's a tough one for me. You know, I've had this conversation with a few different people. You know, I'm good friends with Matt Pilkington, who's a a hugely successful youth coach over here, you know, arguably one of the best in the country. Um, And he's still not totally settled on it. You know, I've only ever worked, uh, I've actually been quite fortunate, I've only ever worked with college and uh, professional men's teams, you know, uh, since I've been working professionally. So it's difficult for me to say. Uh, I think you can be doing some basic stuff, you know, around 12, 13 sort of age, um, and then get into some more, you know, developmental pathways and expectations and Let's review your events based on these expectations around 14 or 15, probably. But that's just my opinion. I'll be honest, uh, I'm not a youth coach. I'm by no means a youth coach, and I've never worked for a youth academy. So uh, I wouldn't want to, you know, concrete commit to saying this is what you should be doing at all. You know, I would suggest that anyone's interested in that to reach out to a very good youth coach and ask them. Moving on now to coach education. Um would I be wrong in saying there's just not enough of a focus on courses and on the analysis side, how to use it effectively? 
<laughs> Obviously, you're speaking to an analyst, so I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, you know, I, you know, a lot of the reason me and you started talking a few months back is is because of the the coach education side of things that I'm trying to push a little bit now. Um, I when I started at Virginia and Sheffield Wednesday, and even recently, you know, I've been looking for high level analysis courses. You know, how does a regular Joe, like a regular coach, how do they learn the best practices of analysis? Uh, you know, there's so many coaches out there that kind of just they do video analysis, but they don't know why they're doing it except to improve players. But then how do you improve players? Uh, it's not as easy as just let's show them all their good stuff and their bad stuff and have a chat about it. Like in my opinion, if you do that, you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. Like where's the developmental pathway and where's the plan for this player? And I don't think there's really much out there for for these coaches. And even on even on very high level courses, you know, your A for A's and your A for B's and stuff, there's an analysis aspect to it. Like you have to analyze a game, but there isn't really anything beyond that. So you're analyzing an individual game, but where does that tie into the overall coaching process? And what's your long-term vision? And how does that tie into your season long objectives? And that's why I decided to build my coach tech courses uh, is because there's nothing out there that teaches a coach how to analyze in the long term and how to build a system of analysis that's going to help them improve players and truly improve their teams in the long term. I still think a lot of the analysis education out there is, okay, here's a game to analyze, break it down and show good pressing moments and bad pressing moments and, and whatever, and that's fine. But what does that mean for your team in the long run? Are you pressing well more than you were six weeks ago? You know, and how do you measure that? And how do you use the objective information from that to influence player behavior? And that's where I think there's a lot, a lot of work to be done in this area. Yeah, it's, I find it really interesting. Like I, I always say to coaches, like if, if you want to shoot me anything, I'll, I'm happy to look at. Match reports are probably the most common thing I get sent. Two things, the, the variation between the, the difference of setup in them. You know, there's no template that's used even by coaching. I, I have an A license, I have a pro license. Can you take a look at this? I have a D license. It doesn't matter. It changes in every one. But the biggest thing that that I see is that nobody ever relates it back to the body of work. And that's what you're saying there, right? The six week plan or something about what what's this? How does this fall into plan with your development piece or your tactical plan, stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, while you mention it, yeah, I, I also built a like a scouting course that teaches people how to build what I think is a very professional and high quality, like almost scouting report or post game report. Um, but going back to your point, yeah, I think you take a, like um, the example I mentioned before about a team pressing, right? Say, say you've got 15 opportunities in your opinion as a coach to press during a game. And on this particular game, you did it 10 out of 15 times, which is great. And in your post game analysis, you know, you can say, we think we press fairly well and you can show some video of it and do some diagrams or whatever it is. But how does that relate to the long term? You know, last week you might have only pressed well five times out of 15 and the week before three times. So just by a natural progression, okay, your pressing is getting better. Three, five, ten, you know, what's it going to be next week? And there you've got some actionable information that you can say, okay, now the percentage of times we're pressing are the correct and we do it the right way. And that's great, but... I think a lot of people get caught up in the X's and O's of one individual game and this movement here and that movement there. And it's important. It's definitely important. But in the grand scheme of things, does that mean that next week it's going to happen the same way? Or does that mean that the week after you've got confidence in your team that they'll be doing it better? And I think just focusing on the one individual game to do a game analysis. Yes, you might be able to coach your team the following week on a Tuesday night, okay, we didn't do this great at the weekend. But what does that mean in the long term for your team? Are, are you kind of identifying that it's a major weakness of yours or is it a one-off? Is it a blip? Is it because, you know, this player was playing and he was not great, you know, he didn't eat very well or didn't sleep very well and he was a bit sluggish. So he was five yards off the pace and it caused these tactical problems. I think there's too many small variables and small little nuances in the game 
to focus on just one game and start making decisions on training sessions and and things like that you're you're in an area where there there aren't a lot of resources you've kind of come across a, or a pathway where you've made your own pathway all of, especially in the u.s there aren't a lot of resources to read on how to analyze a game as you're saying and you're providing that with your coach tech soccer how do you grow professionally how do you get better what do you read what do you look at um so i i've always kind of valued it sounds strange for someone you know in the professional environment i've always valued you know blogs from people on twitter and whether that's you know ted newton at stats bomb or you know michael carley you know these type of like very high level analytics guys or whether it's um you know what you'd call your x's and o's bloggers that talk about you know shape and pressure and and half spaces and all stuff like that you know i i try and read around the subject as much as possible um but i'm still i'm in a field and in a place in my field where you know there's obviously very very good analysts that are better than me at, at man city and at man united and liverpool and chelsea and all these places and outside of going to visit them and i'm racking their brains it's kind of up to each individual analyst to to kind of forge their own path and build their own development which again is is sort of a motivation for me to launch coach tech and start working with college coaches and even professional coaches and USL coaches who want to learn the analysis side of things and have realized that there is no developmental pathway for them. You know, I'll give you a perfect example is um, now working with Florida State women with Mark Krikorian. Um, He basically reached out to me one day through a contact and said, I'm looking to work on analyzing individuals and kind of getting them from year one as a freshman to where they need to be in year four. And I've got a huge range of experience of doing this already. Is there anything you can help me with in the analysis side of things? So I, I kind of basically gave him access to the individual analysis module on the course. And he, he went through it with his staff and he was like blown away by it. And now he's kind of provided the course itself for his staff, for all three of them. And basically we talk almost weekly at the moment through the season about how his processes are working on an individual level and i just helped him hire an analyst so he he decided he wanted to go the the operations assistant route kind of like my path at virginia and we found him an analyst from england that's now working there so that's an example of someone who's you know a very very high level almost an elite level of the women's game over here not really having any clear pathway about how to use analysis still so in other words, get out and learn and read and absorb as much info as you can on as many levels? Yeah, for sure. You know, like I I really don't think there's, and even my courses, you know, I'm obviously going to say I think they're good because I built them. <laughs> but I I really, there's nothing you can point to and say, okay, if you want to, if you want to be where you need to be, take this course and do this. It's, you know, this, it's not like a natural progression where you know you you get your e license and then your d and your c and and go up the the coaching pathway like that there's there's nothing out there really except for reading around the subject and, and networking to be honest finishing up the exciting news that we're teaming up for an elite individual development webinar series um, an evidence-based approach to improving young players using video and training methods from MLS and NWSL. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what we ex- can we expect from, from your end on this? Yeah, definitely. So like you said, I'm, I'm really excited to, to kind of do this project with you. And Gary, I've got a knowledge base of the coaching side of the game over here, which is fantastic. And I'm hoping to bring the kind of working analysis model over with me. So what we're hoping to do, I think, is show where on the individual level, we're going to hopefully show where video analysis and using video to drive some data can help drive your decision making as a coach and what you might feed back to a player to improve them and to work towards your playing philosophy. Uh, And I'm really excited about that first webinar for sure. I think it's going to be really interesting and we're going to give some genuine insights into 
some training methods and some example video from Albert Ellis here at Houston Dynamo in Major League Soccer. So uh, uh, for anyone who signs up for the webinar, you're going to get a, a real life working example of a problem identified in an elite multi-million dollar player and then what we did to try and change his behavior and then some video example of how that behavior has changed this year which i'm i'm really excited about and it'll be everything right it'll be the game it'll be the training it'll be stats and then it'll be the i suppose the art of coaching how to get that communication process with the player as well yeah absolutely so we're gonna you know there's gonna be kind of no barriers at all there's nothing that i'm not allowed to show so we're going to show some game film from uh, last year, some examples of uh, some behavior in, in Albert Ellis that we identified as a potential issue. And then we're going to open up about how we sat with him and showed him these examples and the conversations that took place. And I believe you're going to bring, obviously, the, the coaching aspect of this to the group. And then we're going to kind of go full circle and show how that's changed this year and improved him so we're going to show his his goals assists chances output that's that's had a positive benefit on him so it's gonna be really good brilliant oh i can't can't wait of obviously from a from a selfish point of view working at getting into the analysis side on a very very basic level a few years ago and looking to improve that and and have ideas challenged is something that i'm really really excited to do with you so Thanks so much for, for the chat and excited to team up on this here and we'll have everything, the registration's open, so we're good to go. Yep, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's going to be great and uh, for anybody listening, uh, I look forward to hopefully presenting some, uh, some more detailed stuff to you in the coming weeks and you'll hopefully see that I'm not just all talk and I actually do something <laughs> useful here at Houston. <laughs> Brilliant. Ollie, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much to Ollie for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. A uh, couple of takeaways for me. The first of all was just his career path. And I think you can learn a lot from someone who is passionate about a certain element of the game and has maybe has created most of his opportunities with the commitment and the drive and the ability to convince people to think outside the box a little bit more uh, when you go back to that meeting that he talked about at Virginia uh, with the staff about how he could help their team improve and I think that's a really really big takeaway for coaches that are again looking at getting jobs looking at advancing progressing um, improving it's always if you can think about how you can improve players at the next stage or if you can think of how you can improve teams at the next stage or help the coaches that you want to work with I think it opens up a lot more doors and challenges you to think in a different way than well I wish I was working at that level or I wish I would get this job um, so really enjoyed that the other side of it of course was Ollie's ability to challenge uh, ideas and methods um, both on the playing side that piece of the crossing and maybe how redundant it is in comparison to how productive we really think it is and then also on the individual development piece um, which I've enjoyed with like I said at the start working alongside him um, on my own personal growth with it always asking why we do what we do and then how can we improve it and I think if we want to make player development specific to each individual um, our processes must constantly be improving and they must be adaptable because there's always a better way rather than saying, well, we do player development or we do this or we do that, but maybe there's a better way in doing it and maybe there's a better way to communicate. And I think in today's soccer world, you've got to be so agile when you're working in these areas and always willing to improve and always willing to learn. So like I said, hope you enjoyed that uh, as much as I did and it's definitely helped me improve over the past couple of months. So if you enjoyed it, um, which I hope you did, please go ahead and check out the webinar that we're doing together on elite player development. Looking at adopting an evidence-based approach to the individual player development, then how does that align with the playing philosophy? Looking at training, looking at video analysis, looking at player evaluation sheets, looking at how to progress player development, how to reinforce good habits, how to put that in your own environment 
and then how to communicate that with your staff as well. So really, really excited about that there. The link will be on social media. Uh, you can sign up. There's only 100 spots available. So please go ahead and sign up. And uh, Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know what you think. As always, on Twitter, at Gary Kernin. On Instagram, at Gary Kernin. Always, always, always appreciative of people who reach out and also of course for listening as well so thanks so much and have a great week thank you for listening to the modern soccer coach podcast for more coaching topics sessions and resources head on over to coach kernin on facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com